and presidential runoff election today, Monday or Tuesday. This comes as losing candidates in the first round have been endorsing either President George Weir or former Pre Vice President Joseph Wakai. The two candidates in the runoff, Alexander Cummings, had been expected to do well in the October 10th first round vote, but he did very poorly. He tells me that his party is investigating what happened, but declined to say whether he would mount a formal complaint. We believe the results announced do not reflect the will of the people. We believe the election was fraudulent. We are trying to investigate and to understand uh, what happened and to try to prove that. It seems unfathomable that in 2017, when I was not known by anybody in the country, we got 7% of the electorate. And after, you know, six years, uh, we got less than 2%. And so the, the results, you know, make no sense to us. And again, we're trying to investigate. Do you plan to challenge the first round process? So we are investigating and we'll only challenge if we think we have enough proof. If we don't, we will continue the process more again for posterity to make sure we understand what happened so that we can avoid the sort of fraud that happened this time in the future. You have met with both President Weir and former Vice President Mbwaka. Who do you plan on supporting in the runoff? Yeah, what I find interesting, James, is that both the President of the Republic and a former vice president of the former ruling party both asked for meetings and actually came to my residence soliciting my support in the second round. You know, typically one percenters, two percenters don't get that kind of attention. But we set up a process for making that decision. That decision will be based on our change agenda, which of these institutions we believe is committed to fundamentally changing our country. I asked you on this same program, Mr. Cummings, almost a year ago about why the opposition would not field a single candidate for the first round. And I think you said that would happen in a possible second round. Now, some people say, are you trying to cop out of supporting Boakai? Well, uh, James, there are some things that fundamentally changed between the time we had that discussion and where we are with regards to Vice President Boakai, his ticket, and some of the folks around him. But we cannot and we should not blindly give our support to anybody. Our support should be based on the interests of the Liberian people. And I make no apologies to anybody for engaging the two parties in the runoff around the issues we fought this election around, meaning judicial reform, meaning changing the economic environment so that businesses and the private sector can thrive, women empowerment, these are substantial issues that we believe, if addressed, will begin to change and reduce the suffering of our people. And so, yes, opposition, current ruling party or former ruling party, we want to have discussions around these issues. And we want them to publicly commit to the Liberian people that they will address these issues. So, Mr. Cummings, when do you think uh, you will or your party will complete the assessment? And when do you think? a possible endorsement or non-endorsement of either President George Weir or former Vice President uh, Joseph Waka would come. My hope is that by Monday or Tuesday next week, we'll make a decision. It's not helpful to drag this on to an extended period of time for our endorsement or non-endorsement, as you say, to be relevant. It has to happen in a timely fashion. So we're going to work towards uh, sometime early next week to make that announcement. Monday, Tuesday, worst case, Wednesday. Mr. Comics, thank you so much. A pleasure always to speak with you. Thank you, James. My pleasure as well. And uh, we'll continue to have conversations going forward, I hope. Alexander Comics is the leader of the opposition collaborating political party of Liberia. He was speaking with us from the capital, Monrovia. Human Rights Watch has called to Mozambique's government to release all those it says were arbitrarily arrested during last Friday's peaceful protest. Mozambique officials were not immediately available for comment. Zenaida Machado is the Human Rights Watch Senior Researcher for Africa. She tells me that Mozambican authorities should investigate the security forces' use of excessive force and have those responsible prosecuted. The march of the opposition itself was uh, quite peaceful, but um, maybe half an hour into the march, they were met uh, with uh, heavily armed officers. 
with uh, armory vehicles who requested the group to change routes without providing an explanation for why the routes needed to be changed. And before people even took the, the decision to respect those orientations to change the route, they began to fire uh, tear gas, rubber bullets, and uh, live bullets as well against um, people that were participating in the march. And then the chaos began. People were running all over the place. A lot of people got injured. Security forces said over 70 people were detained. We are still in the process of verifying how many at this stage are still in jail, in what charges, and when are they going to appear in a court of justice to be formally charged. But uh, before that even happened, our own appeal is that the government should release those that were arbitrarily detained because we are aware we have evidence that a lot of people were actually detained arbitrarily, uh, illegally, because participating in a peaceful protest is not a crime in Mozambique. And they were just exercising their civil right of uh, assembling, protesting. Zenaida, um, did you uh, try to reach the police? Because my understanding is that the police were saying that perhaps the root of the protest was closer to the presidential building. Did the police say why they stopped the protesters? No. I mean, the police did not say why they stopped they did not provide an explanation, but the usual position from them is that the protest was illegal, and that wasn't the right moment to protest. But those are arbitrary decisions of the security forces. There's no way in the Mozambican laws that have anything similar to not the right time to protest or explains the illegality of a protest in the terms that uh, some of the police spokespeople have come out to justify. A hooded man burst into the 42-year-old woman's tent while her children were out searching for food, and then raped her in the displacement camp where she had fled war in eastern Congo. I want to scream. He took my mouth and he threatened me with death. She said, mother of four who was abandoned by her husband after she became disabled in a motorcycle accident several years ago. Now she says she lives in fear and hesitates to let her children leave her side. Sexual violence by armed men against displacement women is increasing rapidly in eastern Congo as years-long conflicts continue. The trend underscores disproportionate consequences for women and girls in the region's perpetual state of war. The Associated Press is not identifying survivors who spoke to journalists in the Bulengo displacement camp. In Bulengo and other displacement sites nearby, an average of 70 sexual assault victims each day visit clinics run by Doctors Without Borders, also known by its French acronym MSF. Conflict has simmered in eastern Congo nearly three decades. The United Nations estimates that more than 130 armed groups are active in the country's north East, vying for land or resources while some have formed to protect their communities. Sexual violence has long been used as a weapon of war by armed fighters in the region. More than 4 million people were displaced within Congo because of conflict in 2022, the most in Africa and second in the world only to Ukraine, according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. Of nearly 100,000 people who arrived at displacement sites near the eastern city of Goma in July, nearly 60% were women and girls, according to the International Organization for Migration. Doctors Without Borders treated 1,500 female victims of sexual violence in just three displacement camps outside Goma in July, more than double the number in May, the organization said in September 18th report. Survivors and aid workers say displacement rips people from their livelihoods and leaves women and girls vulnerable to assault.
Like many other displaced single mothers, the 42-year-old mother of four is struggling to feed her family and unsure when she might return home. With the help of her two sons and two daughters, she had cultivated her food of cassava, potatoes, and beans. But in February, armed rebels and Congolese security forces clashed close to her home in the northeastern village of Kalenga. One May evening, after three months of struggling to feed her family in a camp with tens of thousands of other displaced people, she sent her children to find food they hadn't eaten all day. She said that's when a stranger found her alone and raped her. After the attack, she confided in a friend who directed her to a clinic run by MSF, the charity group along with United Nations agencies and local organizations help provide medical services, psychological treatment, latrines and other measures to improve conditions for survivors of sexual violence. But their role is limited. The rivers of food and other basic needs to the camp are infrequent, said Rebecca Hiu, MSF's regional sexual violence activity manager. The campus conditions leave women vulnerable to abuse. Shelters are little more than plastic, no way of securing them from intruders. Kihiyu said armed men lack outside the camp where women and girls are forced to venture to find firewood and other necessities. They know that they will go and find these assaults outside the camp, but they have no option. Kihiyu say, already scared by fleeing their homes, survivors of sexual assault in camps like Bulengo live with the experience long afterward. It's a trauma that will stay for a lifetime, said Alabre, coordinator for UNFPA, gender-based violence programming in Northeast Congo.